Yeah, so we're just getting started. This is a real treat. We've got a class from just outside of Boston who's joining us to listen to Tony Donne um, speak on the, the, the fascinating subject of fusion energy. Um, we've also got somebody from Botswana joining us. We have somebody from Thailand joining us. So um, yeah, there you go. Uh, also, also Germany and um, of course, uh, Tony is is actually also, if I'm not mistaken, um, based in in Germany, uh, and I'm also in um, in Western Europe. So, um, well, without um, further delay, uh, let's let's get started. Um, actually, um, so this is this is climate solutions uh, with an eye towards fusion energy. And Tony Donne, who is sitting just to my my right, <laughs> is, um, is one of the, the world's foremost experts on fusion energy. He's the CEO and program manager um, for Eurofusion, who also oversees Demo, D-E-M-O, which he will talk to us um, more about. Now, as everybody, gets settled in um i'm gonna i'm gonna screen share and just do um a quick a quick video introduction um as to what frontier dow is so people can get a sense of what we're frontier about DAO is a decentralized autonomous organization focused on scientific and engineering innovation it is one of the first DAOs focused on scientific pursuits hence one of the pioneers in DSI, Decentralized Science. As a collective, Frontier DAO's main mission is to make scientific research, collaboration, innovation, and commercialization more accessible to wider groups of people, regardless of where they come from. Our philosophy, echoing that of NASA's, is that good ideas come from everywhere, and we are using the blockchain and Web3 tooling to help facilitate that people with good ideas drive and determination, get access to funding, mentorship, peer support, and paths towards collaboration and commercialization, while still protecting their IP. Frontier DAO is committed to creating public goods by leveraging emerging technologies to benefit every human being on our planet. Catalyzing space and fusion technology incubation, Frontier DAO is working towards the vision of clean energy democracy, that is, clean, cheap, abundant, on-demand energy for all. By facilitating multiple pathways for funding for fusion energy innovation, Frontier DAO aims to collectively help make clean, affordable, and accessible energy available for everyone on the planet. We aim to do this by supporting paths to commercialization of this new technology, while still protecting the rights of the inventors and researchers to ultimately create a more vibrant, abundant future on this world and off-world that is shared more equally by all. Frontier DAO's work to support research as well as inclusivity in science, engineering, and the aerospace industry includes adopting space technologies to Earth sciences to improve the quality of life on planet Earth as we simultaneously reach for the stars and become a multi-planetary species. Visit FrontierDAO.xyz today. If you have questions or would like to know more, feel free to reach out to co-founder Paige Donner on LinkedIn. Okay. Oops. Okay. All right. Okay. So thanks for that. I think maybe we're we're settled in now. Um, so this is uh, this dedication to fusion energy is one of the reasons why Tony agreed to to come and speak to us today, and I'm really honored to have his presence. And also, this is the third talk he's given today. So um, let's give the gentleman props for um, being a, a, a superhuman today. Um, Tony, I know I've left a lot out here. Um, please start with how, you know, what you do as program manager and CEO of Eurofusion. And if you could tell us what is Eurofusion and its consortium of 31 countries. Uh Thank you very much, Paige. Well, I, I, I presented a little bit also during my talk. Uh, so Eurofusion is 
the largest scientific organization in Europe, if you look at the number of member states which is involved, it's certainly not true if you look at the budget because then CERN and some others are much bigger. Um, but we are coordinating fusion research in a, in a very wide area. Uh, my role is to implement the program. So we developed the strategy um, together with my team. Uh, we, we are developing this. And maybe the best is if I try to share my screen. And uh, let's see whether I can also get a large screen. Uh, so now you see the, uh, the full screen. OK, perfect. Um, let me see whether I can get rid of my video panel and I get rid of my uh, floating meetings control. Okay, now there we go. Uh, so the talk is a little bit a mixture of, um, yeah, what fusion is, what makes a difference from fission, what uh, are the advantages and the benefits, uh, but also what we are doing. And um, I tried also to taper it a little bit to what we just have seen in the video, how, how can we make fusion available for the world? So um, to quote one of the most pronounced scientists in the world in recent times, Stephen Hawkins, uh, he wrote a book, Brief Answers to the Big Questions. It was the last book he wrote before he passed away. And the very last question he answers is, what world-changing idea, small or big, would you like to see implemented by humanity? And then he answers, this is easy. I would like to see the development of fusion power to give an unlimited supply of clean energy. Well, why is that? Well, fusion is low carbon. It doesn't emit any carbon during the process, only during the building. The building, uh, there will be some CO2 emission in the making of the concrete, etc. It's safe. You cannot have a meltdown. You cannot have a chain reaction. I will explain why. It's very reliable. It's baseload energy. You turn it on and you turn it off whenever you like, but you don't have to wait until the wind blows or the sun shines. It's sustainable because you don't need much fuel. Uh, actually, if you just uh, take one glass of water and a 30 gram lithium battery would be enough for everyone which is now listening to generate the electricity for the next 30 years of your life. Uh, so it's 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 really very uh, a very energy dense process. I will show that. Now, fusion is the energy of the sun. And here's a little movie from NASA. And if we if we think about it, most of the energy we use on Earth is indirectly uh, driven by the sun. Think about fossil fuels. They were plants 10,000, 100,000 years ago. They were covered by uh, sand, by sediments, and slowly due to the pressure, they have converted into oil, gas, and coal. Uh, wind energy. Wind is driven by temperature differences on Earth, and so is driven by the sun. And also photovoltaic cells, the direct use of light from the sun, is actually driven by the sun. But what happens in the sun? The sun is uh, getting its energy from nuclear fusion. It means that the sun is fusing very light atoms to heavier ones. And how does that work? Well, let's look at the simple atom. The simple one is hydrogen you see it here and the atomic nucleus is a proton but you have hydrogen in three flavors you have the more heavy hydrogen uh, sorry uh, deuterium a uh, deuterium has a proton and a neutron i tried to get my cursor but i don't see it anymore oh, there it is uh, so deuterium has a proton and a, uh, a proton and a neutron Neutron uh, weighs um, roughly the same as a proton, it's double. And tritium is a proton with three, uh, new, uh, two neutrons. Uh, so all these uh, have a charge of uh, plus one and they are chemically identical to the ordinary hydrogen, but they are two and three times as heavy. Now, if you fuse deuterium and tritium, which is the easiest reaction on earth, if you merge them with enough energy, you get helium and a neutron. And in this process, you create a lot of energy. And that energy uh, you can then use for electricity generation. Now, deuterium occurs on Earth. In every liter of water, there's 33 milligram of deuterium, which you easily can take out. 
tritium doesn't occur in Earth, we need to make that in the wall of the uh, reactor. I don't have too much time to explain how that works because then I need like two or three hours to talk to you. Uh, many people confuse fusion with fission. Fission, you start with a very heavy nucleus, you bombard it with a neutron, and then you get lighter product, product, uh, products, like uh, in the picture at the bottom, barium and krypton and neutrons. And also here you create a lot of energy. Hey, that is strange, isn't it? If you merge two light nuclei, you get a lot of energy. If you split a heavy one, you get also energy. Well, everything is in uh, this diagram and um, it's all related that if you start with the very light atoms, you merge them, then actually the average binding energy per nucleo goes down. So we start with two helium and three helium, that's deuterium and tritium. We get it four helium and we create a lot of energy. You can also start with uranium, split it, then you go down. And whenever you go down in this curve, you gain energy. And you can see that the most stable nucleus there is in our periodic system is iron. Iron, you can, well, you can fuse iron with something else. You can also split it if you like, but that will cost you energy. So this is why fusion and fission are completely different processes, but based on the same that you convert mass into energy. So now um, in the sun, the process takes place at a temperature of 15 million degrees. And in the sun, fusion is easy because the gravity is so enormous that the particles are already very close to each other. But on Earth, we need a temperature which is 10 times higher, 150 million degrees. Well, how the heck are we going to do that? Well, look, I have here a simple experiment. I have a tube. Uh, it's um, a vacuum tube. We fill it with deuterium tritium. It's a transparent tube. Otherwise, we cannot see what is going on. Um, I call it everything blue because it forms of hydrogen, doesn't matter. And now we are going to heat it. And the heating can be as simple as microwave heating. And if you turn on the heating, then at some point the particles, they get so much energy that the atoms, they split in the atomic nuclei. So the protons and, and the neutrons, so deuterium and, and, and tritium nuclei and negative electrons. So you have a gas of charged particles. We call this a plasma. Now, if you turn on the heating further, all these particles get more and more energy. And the idea is, can we heat it high enough that when two particles meet, there could be some fusion? Well, the problem you see already that, uh, well, the particles get more energy, but they go in all directions. They hit the walls. And when they hit the walls, they give energy to the walls. The walls get warm and the particles lose energy. It's not a good idea. But a solution here is to apply a magnetic field. And when you apply a magnetic field, all the particles, they line up. They follow the magnetic field lines. They spiral around the magnetic field lines. And now they cannot hit the walls anymore. They still can collide with each other. They can lead to fusion reactions. Of course, you see a problem. The particles now hit the end walls of our vacuum chamber. Now, a simple problem, a, a solution there is to bend it around. And then we get a, get a device called the tokamak. So it's a, uh, well, basically, there's many people in the US listening. It's like a donut. Uh, so these are the magnetic field coils. And we have additional field coils in the middle. And when we run a current through this, then we also can drive a current through this, this um, uh, plasma. You can see it here. So we run a current, we get this current in the uh, plasma, it, it acts very much like a transformer. And this current drives to the magnetic field, which is in this direction. And additionally, we have a magnetic field by these coils, by these bluish coils, which then uh, gives a throw with the magnetic field. And if you uh, superpose them, you get this helical magnetic field line. And this really keeps the plasma more or less floating. We need some additional coils uh, to control the shape and to control the position. But in principle, this is the basic idea. Now, the biggest tokamak in the world is JAT, the Joint European Taurus. It's in the United Kingdom, but it's operated by Eurofusion. And earlier this year, we generated 59 megajoule of fusion energy. That's the world record. Um, well, 59 megajoule um, is, well, 
not so much. Um, uh, it's basically the energy you need to bring 100 liters of water to boil. So um, you can uh, do that with coal, and then you need four kilogram of coal to heat this 100 liter of water. But in our fusion uh, device, we only need 170 microgram of tritium and deuterium. Uh, so really a minor, less than a grain of sand, and we can make this water boiling. Fusion is energy dense. And just to show that, one liter, a kilo of fusion fuel is equivalent to four and a half million liters of oil, uh, 10 million kilogram of coal, 4.8 million cubic meter of gas. And even if you want to compare it to fission, it's equivalent to 100 kilogram of uranium. So it's enormous dense, and uh, that makes it so uh, so good if we get this process to work. Now, uh, on your fusion, uh, what Paige asked me to explain what we're doing. So we are a, um, a consortium of 31 research institutes, and I should correct this slide, 164 universities in the meantime, in 29 European countries. Um, I call it a few light blue because these countries are participating at their own costs, um, uh, whereas the other uh, countries, they are funded by the European Commission via a grant. And in this process, we involve uh, students um, and also many researchers. And I will come a little bit further on how we work. Um, we, we are integrating all the R&D in, in uh, science and technology. And um, we try also to focus on the competences of each of the labs. So our program is uh, competitive, but at the same time, the buzzwords are coherent and common goals. And our central document here is the European Fusion Roadmap. What we did, um, uh, I think already 10 years ago, we said, well, we want to have electricity from fusion. What do we need? What are the gaps? Uh, if we look at our present knowledge, what do we need to do and what is the research plan? And we are very um, much using this research plan to prioritize our research. We are funded by the European Commission and that also comes down with requirements and, and, and some constraints how we can spend the money. Um, in all our, our devices, we have now shown that fusion is plausible. We can um, uh, well make fusion work. And this is not only, uh, let's say, um, uh, JAT, but many other devices in Europe. Um, and there's many devices all over the world, and we all work together. Together with Japan, we are now building a device which comes in operation in March next year, uh, which is even larger than JAT. And that's a step in between. But what is really important is this device, ITER, which is a collaboration of the seven partners, uh, which are mentioned above, China, Europe, India, Japan, South Korea, Russian Federation, and the US. And this device will deliver more energy than we put in. It give, will give 500 megawatts of fusion power versus 50 megawatt of heating power, but it will not generate electricity. That will be done by DEMO, and DEMO is um, coming in operation 2050, roughly. We try to do it faster, but uh, yeah, it depends a little also on the budget we get. And at the moment, many of the countries which are involved in ITER, they're all working on their own demo because there, there's some competition, which I think is very healthy. This is how the European fusion roadmap looks like. Uh, it looks very complex, but uh, just to explain, the final goal is the fusion power plant. ITER is a device which will test all the technologies we need in a fusion power plant, uh, but it will not lead us to there because we don't uh, generate electricity. Uh, that's DEMO, and uh, DEMO will really lead us. And to make these devices a success, we are doing research on many present devices. We also need to work on materials because the nutrients in the fusion process, they hit the wall and they can lead to uh, damage in the wall, displacements of atom in the wall, and we need materials which are resistant to that. And so we are, the reason why now I'm in Zagreb and not in Munich is because today the uh, Spanish king and the Croatian president signed a treaty 
uh, between the two countries to build a 14 MeV neutron facility in Spain. We have also some backup options and we are working very hard on, on um, uh, concept improvements because ultimately fusion should be affordable. Uh, it needs people must be able to pay for it. Now, to show how we work, so we have a number of tokamaks. As I said, JAT is the largest operating device in the world, but there's uh, also quite big in Munich. Oops, that was too fast. Uh, there's another one in, in Switzerland, in France, etc. The Japanese device, GT60, I mentioned also in Prague and Italy, uh, new devices are being built. And what Eurofusion is doing is researchers from all over Europe, they can go to these, res uh, to these facilities to do their work. No, uh, there were always national facilities running for national programs. And what we have made possible is that all the European researchers, they can participate in this work. Also the fallback device, uh, Wendelstein, which is a very complex superconducting uh, machine um, which uh, the diameter is um, uh, something like 15 meters, so it's really large. And um, uh, all the researchers which are interested in this work, they basically are going to Greifswald in Northern Germany. We need materials you can lay on the surface of the sun, and we are testing them in these devices, like this device in the Netherlands, we have a plasma beam with a diameter of about 10 centimeters. We could materials in front of it and the heat load we can generate is exactly the same as on the surface of the sun. And uh, this we can this device we can work basically operate continuously CW so we can test really for a long time materials how they behave. And the same uh, because fusion is not only experiments. Uh, but also uh, um, a theory, a model a modeling. So we operate a um, 10 petaflop uh, device at Cineca in Italy. And we have a number of advanced computing hubs which are helping all the fusion uh, theorists to port their codes to make their code suitable for programming on a high performance computer. So in, in, in principle, your fusion has made um, the uh, fusion program in Europe, which was first a conglomerate of all national programs to one single coherent program. Just to show you how we work, we work on, on demo. We are doing the demo design. Uh, we have a small central team, uh, which consists of 25, 30 people. They're now making uh, the cockpit of the Airbus. Um, we're also remote handling uh, where we pioneered this in JET. It's now used in many fields of science. Uh, so um, fusion is really moving at a fast pace. It will be an essential element of our future energy mix. It's clean. It doesn't emit CO2. Uh, it's safe. Uh, we don't have meltdown or a chain reaction. There's no long lived waste. We have radioactive waste, but uh, after 100 years, you basically could reuse the materials again. So you don't need to store uh, waste for uh, really uh, centuries. It's baseload energy. Uh, it's not intermittent like wind and solar. It has a small footprint. You can see here a diagram of a two gigawatt uh, reactor. A two gigawatt reactor gives uh, enough energy for a city of uh, typically one and a half million households and uh, it's comparable to six million photovoltaic panels or 660 wind, uh, windmills so you need much more uh, sorry much less space and the fuel is abundant because that uh, two gigawatt plant only needs 500 kilogram of fuel per year now uh, some thoughts which could consider. I don't have all the um, all the answers. Um, at least uh, generation of fusion electricity involves large and expensive uh, technical infrastructures, but we need a little bit of fuel, and the fuel is essentially everywhere. So once you have the reactor, uh, you you basically don't depend on uh, individual countries which have the world supply of oil or gas or whatever. 
And the overall cost of fusion in our projections is similar to nuclear fission and, and uh, renewables. Uh, Europe has a rather coherent program, uh, giving all the European countries access to it. And ITER uh, basically has roughly two thirds of the world population behind. And ITER also has common IP. So all the uh, intellectual property is available to all its members for non commercial purposes. And then uh, also, we have many collaborations with other national fusion programs where, let's say, we are going to the US and Japan and China for um, uh, taking part in experiments and they send their scientists to Europe. And then my last page is, of course, if you see the countries which are uh, involved in fusion, it's mainly the countries which are involved in ITER. So it's basically countries in the Northern Hemisphere. There's a little bit of fusion activity in Australia and South America, but not really much. But what about getting these countries involved? And we also want to make fusion available for all of them. What we see and what I didn't cover is that in recent years, many private companies have popped up. And uh, last year, the, the private funding in fusion was even larger than the public funding for the first time. They all promise for working fusion reactors in five to 10 years. I think this five uh, to 10 years needs to be taken with a grain of salt. It's uh, more the horizon for an investor. Um, one issue is that the companies all protect their IP, but they would like to make use of the IP generated by public fusion research. And ultimately, these companies want to make a gain. Uh, but of course, it would be good because their work can also help lowering the price of the infrastructures. You see it in space science where SpaceX and Blue Origin have now made uh, really space flights much cheaper than they were in the past. So, of course, open questions. I don't have the answers. How to steer to fairness and justice and who should do that? Self-coordination, uh, let the field organize itself. Central regulation, IAA is maybe there an organization. Are there any op other options? And the question, what needs to be done? And I think this was my last slide. I hope I have not spoken too long. Tony, that was that was fabulous. You you really you really outdid yourself with that presentation. That was that was wonderful. Um, also, Thank you. excuse me, I, I I think I lost connection there for uh, about a minute, so I had to I had to jump back. You know, I noted that the recording stopped and was started again. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so um, that, that was a, a very in-depth, that was a wonderful, um, uh, that was a wonderful presentation. I'm sure, I'm sure everybody here has a lot of uh, questions for you. Um, it maybe it'd be great to, I'm, I'm going to try to put us in a, in this immersive setting again, it might pop a bunch of us in what we can see there we are okay so, <laughs> so here, here no, we all are. Yeah. <laughs> one, one big happy group. Um, that's fun this way. Oh, the class may have just had to go on their break, but I'm sure they, they learned a lot. Um, as did all of us, you know, um, I, I can imagine that everybody has questions, so they're probably all all burning. And maybe what we could do is do a, a raise hands, and then and then we can sort of take take them in order. Um, but you know, one of the things I mean that was very um, very in depth and very um, scientific, which is with this is a scientific a science community, so that was perfect for us. But I think too, Tony, one of the reasons why you're such an effective communicator about fusion energy, um, which I, I do believe the industry needs more of in terms of effective communication, is your phrase, which is so quotable, that says, we are building a star on Earth. You know, we are building a star on Earth. And um, when I heard you say that, it just kind of transformed everything in my mind about how to how to think about fusion energy um what you know what technologically the, the hurdles to overcome and really you know what's what's being done um i also um well let me let me just open the floor up and and see what 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 questions what questions are are coming from from people i'm sure there's a lot okay 
Um, yeah, very good question. Um, well, uh, looking at ITER, the costs are order 20 billion uh, euro. Um, I don't know which part of the world you are, but I think the dollar and the euro are almost equivalent. So, um, and uh, the main cost drivers are the building. So the concrete is very expensive and uh, nuclear concrete, The uh, especially also the hot cell. Uh, so this is the building where when we take out components from ether, which are radioactive, they need to be stored in the hot cell. They need to be handled there. That's a very expensive building. Also, the superconducting magnets are um, uh, expensive. I myself of the opinion that ether could have been built for half of the price. And um, uh, there are many things why I I think that. Um, one is that um, the way ITER has been set up is that all the seven partners, they deliver components in kind, um, which um, means that, well, the idea is that after ITER, every every party can build build his own demo. And um, this, this basically has led to the fact that the vacuum vessel is made in Europe and Korea. Uh, the um, the coils, the magnetic coils, are built in uh, seven countries. Um, so that means in all these countries, you need to set up factories. You uh, you create interfaces. Um, there is things going wrong. Wherever you have interfaces, things might go wrong. And uh, this really had has added enormously to the costs. The other thing which I've seen, and maybe that's more European, um, because you know, in our research laboratories, we have the best engineers in the world, uh, but um, they are research engineers. They are not uh, trained to think, how can we manufacture a component? Um, and what we have seen in ITER is that some components, um, and not only ITER, also some other devices, some components, they are designed and then um, uh, you you go with your blueprints to the industry and then the industry says, well, but, but we cannot um, um, uh, make this. We need to redesign. And a lot of money is spent in redesigning components. So I think we could uh, build a reactor in the order of 10 billion, maybe demo the breeding blankets, but I, I think the reactor is expensive infrastructure. The fuel is is cheap. Uh, so uh, for a two gigawatt reactor for well, basically for big city, uh, one and a half million households. So that's typically like five million people. You need only 500 kilogram of fuel, 200 kilogram of deuterium and 300 kilogram of lithium. Uh, 300 kilogram of lithium are 10 used car batteries. Uh, so um, we, we can make use of old car batteries in a sense. Um, then for the second question on the innovation, uh, we are constantly working with companies because we constantly drive the, uh, the state of the art of innovation. So uh, at the one hand, it happens automatically in industry when you evolve industry and they're building for us. They need to innovate, otherwise they cannot make what we want from them. And this helps them enormously. And uh, for instance, CERN and ESA, they, uh, the European Space Agency, they have uh, uh, done some surveys where typically um, all the companies which, which uh, work for them, they have on average a multiplier of factor of three in different markets. But then additionally, we also have a very active technology transfer program. So uh, whenever we have findings, we work with brokers which are related to industry, which can, can see opportunities for industry. And so we are working with them. And so many of the technologies which we're developing, for instance, a camera which we developed for uh, looking at the plasma is now used for detecting cancers in human beings. And um, so there's this spin off in many, many different directions. I hope this goes for give an answer to your question. Yeah, I... the materials to build the let's say the the European demonstration reactors. To, we start with a starter blanket where we have the materials which can go up to twenty displacements per atom, which means that every atom in the first surface of the reactor is displaced over the full lifetime by twenty times, and still the materials they uh, don't lose their characteristics. You still can use them. 
But ultimately, we want to go up to 70, maybe 100 dPa. And for that, we need a 14 MeV nutrient source to test. Yeah, actually, that's the reason why I'm here in Zagreb, because today there was a treaty signed bec uh, between Spain and, and Croatia to build such a device. And construction will start very soon in Granada in Spain. Uh, so that's very important. Of course, uh, the testing with these devices is is uh, taking quite a lot of time, and um, it's also very costly. Uh, for that reason, we also do a lot of modeling, and also AI comes in there to to try to uh, develop uh, new materials. And uh, the best is to do that now virtual uh, in silico in the computer. And then use that, and once you have a hint what could be better materials, then you try to develop them and you test them for real. Thank you very much. You're welcome. There's another question here around the immersive yeah. table page. Yeah, cool. I think that's I think that's rod. You know, also to, yeah. to <laughs> explain to you, these are um, we're kind of a a bit of a, a group. Um, where we're studying how to use regenerative finance as applied to emerging technologies like fusion, like space exploration. So a couple of these uh, guys are, are we're, we're, part, we're part of this group. So they're, they're already very much thinking along these lines. And uh, after Rod's question, I, I want to um, take up a conversation, Tony, that you and I had not too long ago about how what you do with Eurofusion is not all that different from what we are trying to do as decentralized autonomous organizations. But let's 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 hear from Rod first because he's always got good good insight. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'm a space systems engineer and I'm in love with uh, space exploration, particularly lunar exploration. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one question um, is more technical. Uh, you like how you manage documentation, how you manage requirements, how you manage uh, interfaces. Maybe do you have any frameworks, software, uh, publications uh, that you could share? Because in general, I have a, a startup, uh, it's called Lonco, and the goal is to make um, a system that would be decent, a model, it's uh, it's kind of a model-based uh, approach to, um, to a complex system design like uh, lunar base. It would be great to hear some insights from your field. I, 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 I missed a little bit the oh. question because the line was. Oh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. So, 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 so the question how you manage requirements, how you manage documentation, how you manage models. Maybe you have some software or frameworks. Yeah. Yeah, for well, especially for demo. So demo is within uh, your fusion is a program, but demo we see as a project, and there we use uh, PLM, and so we have a central uh, document uh, management system. We started um, with uh, uh, meetings with what we call the stakeholders. So we brought people together from um, uh, from energy industry, so people which run energy plants, uh, uh, grid operators. Uh, people which run nuclear plants, also people which are nuclear safety. Uh, we asked them what should be the parameters of demo because we wanted to know the high level parameters. So how many uh, megawatts should we go for? Uh, uh, should it be a pulse device? So should it be continuous, et cetera, et cetera. And then we derive from them the, the kind of um, uh, level one requirements, um, which we then put, uh, we manage them with, with doors, which is, uh, uh, let's say, the software package we use for that. And uh, so from that, they, these are the higher, and we basically um, uh, take, take, let's say, the, the further you go in the project, the, the, the requirements all relate to each other. So that's very much the idea there. So also the models we put in there. Uh, what we are working on is our our design cycle is very slow at the moment, or it was very slow, uh, because when you uh, take a design of demo and you want to change, you want to see what happens if you change the major radius by half a meter, it takes you about a year because you uh, you need to again do new plasma simulations. Then uh, uh, we um, 
uh, need to to uh, do uh, ANSYS calculations. Uh, the strength we need to do neutronics calculation. That is, that is indeed, uh, let's say, um, yeah, very, um, yeah, very elaborate. And we are working now also there on trying to make this whole design cycle faster. Uh, thank you so much. Like a lot of insights uh, and I have one simple question it's more like a nerdy question you've said about generating uh, um um not hydrogen uh, like uh, generating the yeah, yeah yeah could you briefly explain like I know that you do not have unfortunately we do not have three hours but like the main idea no, yeah, the, the main idea is so fusion, uh, so deuterium and tritium give a helium nucleus and a neutron as an end product. The helium nucleus is positively charged, uh, has a lot of energy. It, it, it basically takes 20% of the energy. Uh, that's that's just momentum and, and impulse conservation. Uh, sorry, energy conservation and momentum conservation. Uh, so the helium has 20% of the energy, and that should be enough to heat a plasma. So the helium collides with the other particles and gives the energy, and then we want to get the helium out. The neutron is neutral, takes 80% of the energy, and it goes into the wall. And uh, in the wall, it basically interacts with lithium. That is why we need the lithium. And we split <laughs> lithium in, um, in uh, tritium and helium. Mm -hmm. And interestingly, uh, although that's a, a, a efficient process, it still gives energy. If you look in the uh, the diagram, which I showed before with the binding energies, even there you win a little bit of energy. So the neutron is used to, um, uh, to get uh, the tritium. At the same time, it makes the wall warm. And that is what we use for driving turbines. OK, thank you so much. Thanks, guys. Hey, there was there's a couple more questions. There was one from Nanofo. Nanofo, I was hoping you could unmute and um, ask Tony your your question directly. Are you too shy? <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm too shy. No, um, I'm not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, my first question is: I am a teacher. And I so wish to expose my students to so much. Um, that is going out um, there because I have quite a lot of students who are really exceptional and they are eager to learn. So I wanted to know um, what are what is available for for students who are outside Europe um, who can um, actually, you know, what are the what are some of the things that are available for them to learn about this. And again, as a student, I am I'm doing my master's. And I think this is this sounds so interesting. And I would really wish to know more about about this. And besides, my country has been having so many power cuts lately. And uh, we are about two million in my country and I, I I suspect we can we can benefit a whole lot from this. So how best can we can we take part in this kind of program? Oh, that's that's very good. Um, well, um, we, we I saw it also in the chat coming by. So um, we have a uh, what I call it now a daughter organization because we are the main funder. Um, this uh, organization in Europe called FuseNet which is actually even a little wider than just Europe because they have also uh, participants in, I think, Canada and the United States and uh, also Russia. Uh, they are focused at, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, bachelor and master's and also to some extent at, at schools. Uh, so they develop materials for school teachers. They organize um, annual teacher days or maybe multiple teacher days. Um, they develop laboratory material, which uh, then can be um, uh, distributed. It's usually things you can make yourself, but then they they uh, give you the drawing so you can make it yourself. Um, so this is, um, let's say, a very good organization to, to contact. And their, their email address is indeed fusionet.eu, or you could, could drop me a line and I bring you in contact with these, these people. 
because they're really doing a lot. Of course, as master students, um, even uh, I think many of the European labs are happy to ha host uh, students from all <clears> over <throat> the world. Um, so regularly, uh, I see people coming from well all parts of the world in our laboratories, either for an internship or for doing the master uh, thesis. Of course, it means that you need to make an agreement between your university and, um, let's say, the, the hosting lab. But uh, usually that can be arranged. And also there, uh, FuseNet could bring you in contact, or if you drop me a line, I can uh, try to bring you in contact with, with, the, um, with the people which, which can do something for you. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. That's that's super generous. Yeah, and Charles, you're 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 gonna go next, but I, I wanted to um just uh say you know Nanofo is calling in from from Botswana. Oh well, and, yes. Yeah, and so we were chatting a little bit before the this evening's uh, event started, and she told me that she had collected a bunch of letters from her from her students, and had delivered them to her her president in Botswana, and then. He, uh, the, her president invited her to come and meet and meet with them him so uh, you know and his and his uh, cabinet so um so that that's a great connection because i also tony i have to give you more kudos because i remember at fusion 22 which was a fabulous event just last month in the uk in in october you were one of the the stellar speakers there as well and also, I have to say, you were really the only one who raised, or the only one that I remember, who raised this issue, which you made in this talk as well, that most of this fusion energy research is going on in the northern hemisphere. There's really not much at all going on in the southern hemisphere, except for Australia, and then you mentioned maybe somewhere in South America. So um, it's a topic for another time we're winding down, but definitely fusion energy has the potential to address energy justice issues too so that that's a, that's a big topic today we're sticking with climate solutions but um yeah. let me see the, well, the just, just just uh well if if uh, well if I, I i'm always uh ready to give talks well the virtual talks are very easy i can give them all over the world so i've been today giving talks in Zagreb and uh, canada was my second one and well now i'm already talking to many people over the world so whenever uh, someone says well uh, I really would be interested in talk. I'm, I'm usually willing, or otherwise, I can find uh, colleagues uh, around which are willing to to tell something about fusion and what we're doing. Thank you. Yeah, very, that's very gen really generous of you, Tony. Well, you're, you're giving me too much kudos, by the way. But, uh, <laughs> well, I yeah, okay, I'll stop. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, Charles, you have you've had your hand raised, and I appreciate your patience. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, the first item in, uh, was I I was interested in your uh, discuss your, your the thing you mentioned about um, getting everything to be compatible in terms of the parts. If I understood it correctly, in terms of when you brought it all together from the different countries. And then you put, put it in one room, you know, and then having to adjust that and go back and redo it, uh, and so forth and so on. And I, I just, uh, it, it, it is extremely evocative of of the kind of thing that happens and has happened in the in the in, in, with the rocket industry where. Um, you know, uh, someone like SpaceX does almost everything internally, <laughs> and from one, you know, in in one uh, rather than having even rather than having a, a contractors out doing things, they do a much of the, their work internally. And I, I can see where it could become even more of a nightmare if you're having if you're having to deal with multiple countries, which you know just. The, the hazards of, of uh, communication, um, and uh, you know. Did you have a question? Well, I just wanted to say that I felt that that that, that uh, I I I think it's uh, given what he said about the cost of that problem that I hope that I can find a better solution to 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 compatibility. 
and and and, and reduce the, the, that drain on the cost. Yeah, well, there, there's many many things. So uh, one one other thing which I didn't mention is that Ether was really um, uh, also designed as a machine where different components were optimized and put together. And for demo, we are taking a holistic approach. So we optimize the total design rather than the individual components. Mm -hmm. And also that helps driving the cost down. So there's okay. many elements where, so ITER was a very uh, nice learning ground. Okay. And we learned also many things which we don't need to do anymore. Or we don't want to do in a future device. We, sure. we need to do it better. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, well, I mean, I don't want to, we have, we have a couple minutes um, left. I wanted to, um, if I, if I may, I wanted to just do one, um, I wanted to show one screen share. Mm -hmm. um, can you, oh, it looks like I'm. Looks like I stopped. Looks like I don't have the right screen share up. Let me let me see if I can. It's it's something that the that the White House published on November fourth. Mm -hmm. Can you can you see the November fourth screen or do you yeah. see yes. a Zoom error? No, I'm 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 seeing it. You you're seeing the November fourth White House thing. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I thought maybe I was, but um just to kind of wind down and then I was I was wondering if Tony you could give maybe some closing thoughts just about the future of workforce um for for the fusion and energy so this it only take me a minute to to read this but it's excuse me for the reading classes but so November 4th the White House published this in you know the United States so fusion energy at scale fusion the same process that powers the sun and stars like Tony's been telling us has the potential to transform the energy system. It could provide abundant, clean, reliable electricity anywhere in the United States or around the world and could create a whole new industry and associated workforce. Fusion could potentially meet a large fraction of electricity demand and help eliminate GHG, otherwise known as CO2, emissions from energy intensive industrial processes synthetic fuel production and desalination. So of course, addressing water, water issues. For these reasons, it could have impacts far beyond electricity generation. Because it relies on abundant clean fuel sources, it can benefit national security and improve air quality in areas historically burdened by fossil generation. So, quite something i think to come to come out of <laughs> to come out of the white house who i know has been championing uh this year they they've been championing but i wanted to just zero in in the in the last minute that we have left do you have any thoughts tony about the future of workforce in this in this industry it um, well, we are working on that. So uh, what is very important is to think about all the knowledge and competences you, you need in the future. So uh, we are thinking already now what kind of engineers we need, what kind of scientists you need in, in the future devices. And we are coupling that knowledge back to FuseNet and the university so that they can tailor their, their education programs. And what we see in Europe is a revival of nuclear again, uh, given the uh, climate problem, but also given the recent uh, very pressing energy situation due to dependency of Europe on, on Russia. Uh, so we, we need to, and, and uh, so you see many com countries going back to nuclear, um, which I think is a good thing because it's, uh, I think many more people die every year because of fossil fuels than, uh, let's say, ever have died from nuclear. Um, uh, so I think we should go to nuclear, but it means that we also need to, again, tra start training nuclear engineers, people which can work with tritium, people which know about breeding uh, of tritium, people which which know about neutronics, um, how to operate. So 
it's a very diverse field. It's it's not only nuclear engineering, systems engineering, it's it's AI, it's um, uh, cryogenics. Uh, so many many different fields, and we have to work very hard. We need many people there. Um, and and yeah, we we can only start now. And I, I also for that reason, it's good to to involve many more countries than we now have in the fusion field. Well, wonderful. Well, I want to say thank you very much to Tony Donne for joining us today at Frontier DAO for this uh, energy climate solutions and energy workshop. And thank you so much for our supporters, uh, Filecoin Foundation, Project Liberty. Um, and thanks everyone for, for attending. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and stop the recording now. Mm -hmm.